With some success and some public failure, Metal Arc Media has been growing. I don't know how many employees we have now. 60-some-odd employees. It's a lot of people. It's a lot of responsibility. And there's some people coming through the doors that aren't being properly vetted, like obviously. <laughs> it's hard to get work in Miami. I was always told by my agent, you got to go to L.A., you got to go to New York. This stuff does not exist in Miami, will never exist in Miami. It's hard to get good work in Miami. And we seem to have hired a dud. And worse yet, a loud Knicks dud. Tony's right here. <laughs> what happened? Not this guy you. here, what happened? Not you, Tony. No, it's this Taylor who insists on getting on camera. And how is he a part of this universe? And hey, you're a video guy. Stay behind, stay behind the scenes. But our culture isn't that. Our culture is everybody gets microphones in a free-for-all. And plenty of people are complaining about it over the last two years. Give me the familiar thing. Give me Dan and Stu Gatz. Not a bunch of young voices, 12 microphones. How much more are you going to dilute this f***ing show? I'm a little worried that Taylor just might get his ass kicked. Yeah. Well, Taylor is now on the street. We have punished him. I don't know what uh, we... There's we a guy to... next to him that's, like, looking around to make sure... Okay, he's... Right, he's well, that guy's he's just jaywalking. Don't worry. There's a crosswalk we right there, sir. We sent him... Hump this is the him. punishment for Taylor, and I'm going to make him eat a shoe. Because no. I, I don't yes, know... The, yes, because yeah. I don't know. Roy, look, and this will be bullying. It'll be human resources. It'll be liability. It'll be a bunch of different things. This guy comes in here. I didn't give him a microphone. I didn't tell him to get in front of a camera. I didn't tell him to represent our show. That didn't come from me. I don't even know how he got hired. Then he comes in here, and he's, he's, he's in disguise. It's like a spy. Like, oh, you get our show, but you're a Knicks fan, and you're going to be a loud Knicks fan who thinks that serious analysis from you is what we want on the Knicks. Like, this is your big star turn. And so we've sent him outside in a Brunson jersey to melt. To, I, and I can't wait to do this when it gets hot. You want to work here? Okay. Wait till July out there. As Greeny was talking about on Get Up today, this sun, big yeah. factor. Yeah. Big factor. I know. I, the, the heat he keeps literally getting... went with that again. <laughs> yes, the heat yeah, keeps I, getting... Like, I heard Jalen. We can't discount what my colleague Jalen Rose said, who's played there late in the summer months. You know, it's you know, it's really hot, and you're there for a long time. It does zap you a little bit. You have to walk from the bus to the arena. It's tough. It has been part of the analysis. It's like some old broadcasters are just arriving in another way to say the South Beach flu. Uh, hey, Harden still wants to go to Vegas during the playoffs. Yeah. Uh, the second most ridiculous topic I saw on Get Up today. The first one being, should the Lakers rest their starters in game five? I saw that. <laughs> I saw that. I was like, wait, why? That's a good question. <laughs> um, put it on the poll at Levitard Show so we get blamed for it. Should the Lakers rest their starters in game five? Back to Taylor, though. Are you allowed to not hire somebody because they're a Knicks fan? I don't know what the rules <laughs> Equal opportunity all right of there. that stuff is. But we've hired some people without me knowing things about them. I mean, That's, please tell me so we can finally yeah, get rid like of some gods. <laughs> Um, I don't know what's going on with Stugatz, but his, his behavior keeps getting more and more deviant, and now the drugs begin because now he's doing the Grateful Dead tour uh, for the summer. Good luck with all that, Billy. The drugs begin? Allegedly. <laughs> well, I'm just saying, Grateful Dead, we all – well, he said it before. I'm not revealing anything. I'm assuming that if you're listening to the Grateful Dead and you can't believe how good their music feels, it's because you're on a great deal of drugs. Is their music good if you're not on drugs? No. Put it on the poll, please. At Levitard Show, Juju. Is the Grateful Dead, uh, is their music better only because everyone's on drugs? Many people are saying all over the Internet that Stugatz is presently being or will soon be the ungrateful dead. <laughs> that he, he doesn't look good. He, he looks like there's a problem, and it's because he's been this Knicks fan for 30 years that we've got now outside in the streets. Uh, Miami has been effect, infected by this New York virus, and it's, it's getting worse. They're coming down here and realize they don't want to live anymore in New York because things are getting bad in New York, and they're making our property values go crazy. And they're loud, and they buy up our tickets. They, they, the tickets are now— that, that wasn't that many compared. I guess it's been a weird two games, too, because they've had very little reason to actually get into the game. And any time they made a run, Miami was always there with an answer. But there honestly aren't more Knicks fans there than I usually see in the regular season. I've been in that arena when there are far more Knicks fans. The prices on the tickets have gotten to an insane level with inflation, and uh, New York has made everything here very expensive. I, we've all lived our entire life down here uh, with New Yorkers living here telling us how much greater New York is while living here. 
And it's at the source of the Knicks rivalry. It's part of the reason they felt so betrayed by Pat the Rat. How could you leave the great, the Mecca? The Mecca! How could you leave the Mecca? Madison Square Garden. Doris Burke is still out here saying it's the greatest place to play in the NBA. And they haven't played games that matter for 20 years! Since Pat left, they haven't played games that mattered. I'm so happy that they haven't actually mattered over the last 20 years because this stuff is exhausting. Every time someone does anything in that jersey, they gas them up to the point we saw it. We're living it with, with Julius Randle. Everything is just so extra over there. I'd give them their due if they were actually good. I really would. But they've never actually been good, except for like the 90s. And it's been a long time since then. And the bravado entering this season was absurd. I just, for the life of me, I didn't understand why they were so confident. I love seeing Spike Lee sitting baseline. I don't know. I feel like that's just, I feel like he wanted to sit sideline and he couldn't. Yeah. I got, yeah. those were Jake I, Balvin seats. I got, um, I, I get so much wrong around here. So much. So very wrong. But one of those rants with LeBron was me just screaming, New York, welcome to another decade of irrelevance. And I got 10 years right there because that franchise hasn't mattered. And when they win a playoff game, they're very loud about telling you, do you know how much we mattered 53 years ago with Willis Reed? Do you know how important New York basketball was? But Pat Riley took it and brought it here. It's here now. Uh, Miami's winning over 20 years. If this was happening in New York... If this, if this thing over 20 years had happened in New York, Miami would be a seismic international franchise, uh, not a regional franchise. Uh, you know, they'd be able to build this twofold if this had all happened in New York. And now that everyone's looking at the, the bubble in a different light because of what the Lakers and, and Heat are doing this season, if you look over the course of 12 years, how Miami won three titles in that span and did it with three separate cores – to tear it down, rebuild, to tear it down, rebuild, deplete, uh, depleted of uh, draft capital and assets because Chris Bosh and LeBron convinced them that they wanted the extra year so they had to make those trades and then they gave up all their draft picks ah! to rebuild, get Jimmy Butler to deal with the, the departure of Dwayne Wade and then his return in there. Uh, to get Jimmy Butler with zero dollars in cap space and find a way to make it happen now with your third core is a testament to this franchise. The we, Godfather. We get away from the point. Thank you. Not helpful. Well said. <laughs> Thanks, Billy. Did you burp that up? No. Like, it felt not, like not you. To my knowledge. It felt like he's you, not wrong, Dan. Yeah, Thank you. The Godfather. The Godfather. Yes. And here are all the things that we said just two weeks ago. Then and now. The room unreasonable with their standards. Hey. We're not as good as the Celtics this year. This is unacceptable. Burn it all down. I hate Kyle Lowry. Kevin Love can't guard anyone on the perimeter. They're going to get knocked out earlier uh, than the last five years. They fail, they fail, they fail. While Mike Schur and Bill Simmons are on their podcast, still actively fearing only that team yeah. entirely. You're going to go up against a Buzzsaw Bucks team who's been just one of the best teams all season and then do what? just lose in five games and then get a worse pick like like what are we doing here you like, just want to be in the playoffs to say you were yeah, in the playoffs? I think, like, <laughs> that doesn't make sense what do you mean i think we're not gonna win the lottery are they gonna win the title no okay are but they gonna get out of the first round that like what is this like like let's enjoy some playoff series though i just don't buy enjoy into, what though losing you're not the gm I'm like what do you GM. care what it's like i gotta get a better ping pong ball let's just watch extra playoff basketball but i can watch other what, teams play playoff what, basketball what this, <laughs> like i can i can have a what team that could have a possibility to win a ping pong ball to a guy who's one of the most historic prospects we've ever seen i'd rather have that than than lose in five all of the breaks went miami's way except the one in tyler hero's hand and they well, that went Miami's way, too, technically, on uh, Tyler's way. Um, I don't think that break went their way. I think that break is really bad for them. But the bigger break went their way. I mean, The no, bigger break was what, being one game? No, uh, that's, the biggest break is that Tyler Hero being out uh, dooms them even more than they were already doomed. Least favorite Heat player of all time. Sam. Oh, no. Yeah. 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 Least favorite Heat player of all yeah, time. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. Who else would it be? Yeah. Antoine Mike Walker. Bibby. Mike Bibby. You no, got, no, no, no. You got no, no, no. Ashburn. No, no, no. What is Lowry? What do? <laughs> what does Lowry do other than collect his money? He does nothing. Nothing. Terrible player. 
Awful. Least favorite Heat player of all time. Same. Enough with Kevin Love. It's, it's not working. Is salt and pepper Luke Babbitt. That's what he is. Oh, no. Is salt and, pe salt oh, and pepper no. SMP on, Luke Babbitt. Put it on the poll, please, Juju, <laughs> at Levitard Show. A little touch show. of gray Luke Babbitt. Is uh, Kevin Love salt and Nepo pepper Babbitt. Luke Babbitt. That is the greatest insult I've ever heard. You're just a Nepo Babbitt. Luke Babbitt came here for 20 magical games with that floppy hair. He's a key to the shot, starting rotation. He shot from half court. He's a court. starter. <laughs> key to the starting rotation. <laughs> Totally changed the dynamic in that locker room, Nepo okay. Babbitt. <laughs> I, um, I want to talk about a couple of different pieces of this, including what I believe to be the highlight of that entire sound, and that was good, good, rich terrain, which is the sound Chris Cody made in tepid, scared support of the Miami Heat could be a siren for how it is this community felt about the Heat about 10 days ago. This was the most, we'll get the sound for you, of the most enthusiasm any Heat fan had was just something that squeaked out of the body of Chris Cody, as we were all certain around here, that Giannis and the Bucks would be too much for an eight seed. But I have a larger question, which is how did we hire this Taylor person? <laughs> and why, why is he allowed to seriously give us Nick's bad Nick's analysis? And how much greater should the punishment be than what it is presently at this minute, which he is baking outside of the arena in a Brunson jersey? He's not. He's at his desk right now. Oh, no. Get him back out there. Get, send him back out. Get back out there. Get out there. Get, get, get out. Or, get out. Or eat the boot. Eat the shoe. 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 Eat I want. The shoe. I want to. Uh, I want to bully, job, bully him as we try to muster something out of Nick's. Heat. I would say, and I, I'm not like a legal expert. I would say, don't say you're trying to bully him, because then if he sues you for bullying him, you're on tape saying you're trying. Uh, thank to. you, but we yeah, don't have those departments. Good. Maybe we and promise a promotion. That also I mean, maybe we can get a lawyer. Yeah. 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 Have HR only. Let's just tell him he'll get promoted if he eats the shoe. There is nothing that has made me angry over the last two years, and there's plenty that's made me angry about trying to do all this, than this Nick's infiltrator making his way corrosively into our world without uh, any, expl any explanation and doing serious heat uh, Nick's analysis that was terrible and pro Nick's. I think he needs to be fired, don't you, Greg? I do. This is the new and unimproved Dan Levatar show with the Stugats. Gamble on by DraftKings. Someone out there, bring me a napkin. There's water all over my shoulder. There's water all over the desk on my computer. Oh my god! <laughs> this, <laughs> the okay, ex all right. Let me let me explain to the audience what just happened here while we were, um, you know, trying to get ready for the next segment, because I heard in the middle of the parade of gas bags what sounded like a really funny articulation for basically how Heat fans felt, I don't know, 10 games ago. What is it? Not even eight games ago. Greg Cody, uh, his son, his progeny, around which all things here are the foundation is built, his son tried scared. He's still afraid sometimes to go against the unpopular because if we're being honest here, he still thought Giannis was going to win uh, when the Heat were up 3-1. He was still afraid. He is not the most believing of heat believers. But the sound, the squeak that came out of his mouth, as we all made fools of ourselves, all of us, with more and more obnoxious, defiant analysis of, oh, and by the way, real controversial take this one. Oh, the one seed. The one seed is so much better than the eight seed. <laughs> with, the Fool. with the confidence of that, the one seed always wins there. Basketball is easy to predict. The one seed always wins. That's what happens. And the heat have kind of stunk. All season, except you, at least you didn't call the the game changing acquisition late in the season. Touch of Gray Babbitt. That's correct. Uh, we were smug with great deal of confidence. How much we knew eight seeds don't win. They're not good enough, and everything we say is wrong. But Chris Cody, in the middle of this, wanted to squeak in the defense of the Heat team. Maybe the last few years of culture. Hey, do you remember those glorious years where we believed in all the religious things? that Riley sang into the sky. Chris Cody, scared, understanding that Giannis is better than anyone they have, and scared of both the Knicks and Cleveland, if we're being honest. If we're being honest, scared of the Knicks and Cleveland and Toronto and Chicago and Atlanta and everybody because can't trust this team. 
Here is Chris Cody's. This is what made him spit out water all over the place when he heard for the first I time. Triple H, I did the thing. <laughs> <laughs> this is the siren song for Heat Belief, I don't know, six and a half games ago. You just want to be in the playoffs to say you were yeah, in the playoffs? I, I'm not you saying You just any, want to be in the playoffs to say you were yeah, in the playoffs? I, that's just me thinking to myself, I'm not saying anything crazy here. I want to make the playoffs. Yeah. We're yeah. In the playoffs. I, like, we're yeah. In the playoffs. I, we weren't sure around here. We're yeah. In the playoffs. I, I, still, yeah. Playoffs. I still want the next 10 years of Wemba Miyama. Yeah, right. I still want him. Okay. You have to. In our defense, this was 24 hours after Clint Capella had 30 rebounds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, but yeah, 30 yeah. rebounds. But in your defense, you were hoping for a 0.5 percent chance of something happening. Yes, which I thought was greater than beating the Bucks, and I have exactly. since capitulated <laughs> and apologized directly to Max Strus, who apparently now has the quickest first step in the game. Here's here's the bad thing about our terrible, terrible analysis, and there are many bad things about it. It's that. It's not merely that we were wrong. It's that the low, low percentage chance of getting the lottery ball, so very low, so low, so low, results then in getting that player for 10 years. And the so very low odds of beating the Milwaukee Bucks are, we can't do that. There will be no doing of that. I remember two years ago they were swept and Jimmy shot 30% and Giannis is an unholy nightmare. You want to know who can guard Jimmy Butler when nobody can guard Jimmy Butler? Healthy Giannis, if Budenholzer, who was fired, had ever put him on him. Because when he was on him 117 times in the first round series that the Bucks swept to win the championship, otherwise we'd still be out here saying Giannis kind of a bum. <laughs> kind of a bum if they don't win the championship that year. They held Jimmy to 30%. There was no telling that it would be this for two years later. The Bucks were minus 1,200 to win that series. Yeah. It's absurd. Like, one of the things, while I'm staring lovingly at my wife in a Costa Rican river, seeing her happiness and checking the scores on my phone, 113-113, tied on the internet, because I'm trying to figure out if this thing is going to be bigger than anything that's existed in the South Florida market, which is the surprise underdog that does it. It's the 2003 Marlins. It's the 1997 Marlins. It's the 96 Panthers. It's an 83 Hurricanes team. And it's and it, it can't be this one, right? They, this team loses. This team will lose to Boston. This team will lose to LeBron. This team loses, right? This team can't. Jimmy cannot win the championship. We've been correct. So, we've been so blessed down here in South Florida, and I know that. Yeah, we'll mark that for the next one. Uh, we've been really blessed over the last few months that we've had these underdog stories that you just identified. There is only a handful in Miami sports history, and we've had it four times in the last few months with. Uh, the women's basketball team making it to the Elite Eight. If you want to lump in FAU's run to the Final Four along with Miami's first ever run to the Final Four, all as underdogs, all taking down number one overall seeds on their path over there. And now the hockey team has done that. The hockey team is now, according to our friends at DraftKings Sportsbook, the favorite to win the Stanley Cup as an eight seed. It's only happened once in that sport with the LA Kings winning the Stanley Cup uh, about a decade ago. So, and now the Miami Heat have just totally flipped the narrative. They actually found the turning point in the season. We joked about it. It became cliche. They actually turned it around. The shooting hasn't even had to be that good against the Knicks. And that will be a different thing in the next playoff round. But you, I heard you guys talking yesterday about the fact that everyone talked about uh, the bubble as some sort of aberration, as I thought it was the best basketball I've ever seen in my life played by Denver and Utah. Uh, because there were no crowds, no flights, no tired legs, and it was just offense galore and shooting more pristine than I'd ever seen. Those four teams who had less rest than any others in the era of load management, those four teams are now the remaining teams who have gotten back to the rightful order of what this conference has been for the last four years with the aberration of Giannis wins one in there when everyone is broken, wins it by a toenail, and then tells you you get to redefine failure after he fails more than, I believe, any postseason basketball team ever has. It's not just that a one lost to an eight. It's how you lost 
at home, your floor and your superstar melts down at the end of the game. Never seen anything like it in the history of that sport. He almost threw the ball out of bounds after a tip because he did not want to get fouled yeah. down the stretch. And we like him. And so, oh, then Barkley and Kerr are telling you that Giannis is doing TED Talks when I'm like, if that doesn't get called a failure, nothing in the history of the NBA postseason has ever been a failure because that's always a sure thing to happen in the first round. So much so that you just heard how we sounded with the controversial take of the Bucks are going to drag the heat. And then Chris Cody limps in, and he gets to be heat homer now with this enthusiasm. Yeah. <laughs> you sound like Miley Cyrus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it would sound like what that. Miley do to you? I mean, that was a nice. Oh, you haven't, you haven't seen the meme? That journey's always the most important part of the ad. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Greg Cody of the Miami Herald has been seething for a couple of segments now because of all of that Zaslow stuff and then the, the hard network out. How do you really feel about what is going on here? Because you seem, it, this is one of these rare instances with your father, Chris, you recognize it. He is very protective of his journalistic credibility. He has dedicated his livelihood, his career, yeah. to this thing being yeah. important to him for, yeah. for 40 years as it erodes all around him, as it dies all around him. And Zaslow is, for old, as old as he is, Johnny Come Lately radio gas bag who doesn't have Greg Cody's credentials. But I genuinely believe my dad on this one. I, I think whether it's justified or not, I think he actually looks down at Zaslow here. I think my dad feels that Zaslow has not done enough to genuinely criticize him. Like, I think the Izzy thing, like, you would take more offense by Izzy doing something like that right. than Zaz. I respect Israel. Um, Zaslow, I, I don't even know if he's still on the air. You, you, you put him on this air. I don't know that he's on the air otherwise anymore. He's he? not on traditional air, but okay. as happens with a lot of people who come into our universe, their numbers get a good, solid bump when people like them. Right. And so Zaslow's podcast is, I don't know whether it's competing with yours. Yours is a uh, one of the top uh, podcasts in the genre. I don't know how high Zaslow's podcast is, but he's right. pretty. he's got a good podcast. Yeah, no, we. Uh, I think ours is doing a little bit better based on the numbers I'm seeing, but I don't want to get into that. You know, Zaslow, it, it's unearned arrogance, which is something I really don't like at all. I mean, to for him to refer to himself as a three-time championship broadcaster, like he had two time, any, two time, two time, like he had anything to do with that. Uh, that's like me saying I'm a 24-time Pulitzer Prize winner Dad, because, the team, Dad, I'll because fight I worked for the Miami Herald when they won 24 Pulitzer Prizes. I mean, it's ridiculous. Team broadcasters can say they're a champion. Really? I, I think that that I'm like of all the things that go after Zaslow. I mean, he was their pre and post broadcaster for many years. Yeah, and what did he what did he do to win those championships? Oh, so just just the players get. Yeah, I mean, Olympians. look at Tache, though. I'm looking at Tache, who's grinning maniacally over in the corner because he just saw a ring. I don't know if it's for the first time or not, but Tache in the corner is like... Tache's a champion? I Tache. just had that realization yeah. right now that that theoretically I would maybe get a championship ring. Yeah, you would get a ring. Like one of the cra Holy. one of the lower level rings. Like, I don't care. Yeah. Wait, Plessy, hold on a second. Like you cannot get a ring. You're with you're with like Bally. if you're Bally and you're not a Heat employee, you should not get a I, ring. There's I don't no know the way. answer. That's my my question too. I, but I, I mean, we I do say, the games. No, so. I would say that Greg and you, he was and an employee Dan, of the team. Dan, Greg, you guys as the accomplished journalists here. I feel like if Jeremy has journalistic integrity and credibility, you should turn down the ring, yeah. correct? You can't accept a right. ring if you're unbiased covering the team. I agree with I'm that. I'm not unbiased. Did you hear Jeremy interviewing Kevin Love yesterday? <laughs> he really fanboys. Uh, it isn't journalism. It's my job. Well, it isn't journalism. Your job is not to fanboy. <laughs> yes, it is. He's he's an Billy. Like he works for the team. Look, this is all or... changing. I want you to see it with Taylor, and I want you to see it. Wait, with... no, that part about sports has never changed. He is part of the home team broadcast. No, right. What, but this, what I'm telling you guys, the audience, everybody, as Metal Arc attempts to get younger in a number of different ways, this is the particular infection that comes with young people like Taylor and Jeremy. They are uh, ruining journalism. Yeah, TikTokers. Because, because Jeremy's so mad that we called him. He just said under his breath, I've had better analysis than any of you. And it's oh. accurate. He's pissed, man. <laughs> now it's over his breath. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying you should turn down the ring. Put it Remember on. Remember when you said Jeremy is right earlier? I've been right for three weeks. Put it on the poll at <laughs> Lebatar. Everybody yeah. loves that. About everything I've said. At Lebatar Show, Juju, please uh, put it on the poll. Do, champ do announcers deserve 
rings. This place can break anyone. Jeremy's the nicest guy I've ever met, and he's lashing out at all of us right now. Taylor's also pretty nice. <laughs> We're I mean, being bullied. Okay, but I don't like I, the young people need to learn. Uh, you don't like young people, I guess. Uh, yeah. Or nice people, it sounds like. You, you, you guys have gathered. Um, sp- what are you laughing about? I mean, about? why should an announcer get a championship? He's, he's the, still ripping Zazzle. The championship <laughs> ring has been completely devalued That's because true. everybody gets one mm-hmm. now. Too the many. As, you know, the, the, the assistant trainer, and he does a great job, don't get me wrong, the assistant trainer gets a championship ring. It's ridiculous. The announcer gets a championship ring. You know, it's a cheap knockoff. But this is a new and unimproved Dan Levitar show with the Stugats. Gamble on by DraftKings. Mike Schur is bored. Mike Schur is in the middle of a very stressful time with the writer's strike. Mike Schur is one of the great comedy writers uh, on television for a while now, whether it's Hacks or Brooklyn Nine-Nine or The Good Place or Parks and Rec or his work on The Office. Like we, Metal Ark is thrilled to have him as an overworked intern. He's going to write for the show here his observations from the last month which usually just cook all of us but I can't tell you how much fun it is around here to have actually built up for months to the dramatic tension of Mike Schur is legitimately terrified of this heat team he's about to have a hard time watching these basketball games because he is certain that his team is going to lose it's it's a fandom unlike it's weird Mike I don't get it because Miami fans have been uh, raised on a couple of upsets, and then the Dwayne Wade LeBron teams are going to kick your ass. And now you've got a reputation that is whatever the Celtics were in the 80s, that they're not anymore because Larry Bird's not out there anymore. He's a coward who's terrified of the, of the basketball team and only this basketball team. He wanted the Bucks. He preferred to play against the Bucks. It, I think it's it, it it seems irrational when you. When you talk it out, but fans are traumatized by certain guys. Growing up, when I was a Marlins fan, Matt Diaz was just ah! getting a, a base hit against the Marlins every time. I like it when teams have these these boogeymen. And for Ty the Wigington. for the Boston Celtics, the boogeyman is very boogeyman is very real. The boogeyman is Jimmy Butler. The boogeyman went into their building in Game Six when they thought that they were going to go to the NBA Finals and put up one of the all time playoff performances and. Their hearts were in their throats in Game 7 when he pulled up for a three that the math would tell you was a bad shot, and every person wearing green told you it was a good shot because they were terrified. The Miami boogeyman that goes back to, man, they cared so deeply about Garnett and Ray Allen and Paul Pierce, won one championship as the original super team, and they were built to frustrate LeBron and to get LeBron to change his course of action, which he did. And then... In a game that Boston feared, but Miami feared more because no one down here trusted the blueprint and thought if they hit the bed in that game in Boston, Chris Bosh was going to be traded and the country was going to be laughing at the preening and prancing that LeBron and Wade and Bosh did to bring in another era. Do you realize what we're headed toward, which is not just a rookie coach against Spo, because I think the Celtics are better. But in a rivalry from another time, hey, Boston Celtics, we know you're talented, but you have not won a championship, even though Tatum and Jalen Brown is as strong a duo as anyone's got. And look at look at what's happened in Golden State. They're on the precipice now because at least in part because Clay got old. Are you next? Are you next? And standing in your way is the only guy in the league left that looks like he's cut from the Kobe cloth. Back when those Garnett teams were fighting him for everything, they fear this dude. That fan base fears this dude. And it's crazy. You rarely see that. What frustrates me is when legacy media discusses series like Knicks Heat and and Celtics Heat, the the teams with the history are the teams that most people in the audience – have either seen win one title or none. And when are we going to change that? Why does it still feel like Miami is new money? They 
They're the better franchise. Boston in terms, got, Boston in terms got of a gran- merger. But Boston got grandfathered in. They had the right. history passed down to the children who would become sports fans of your team matters, and they won one with the super team that birthed all the other super teams because LeBron didn't like getting stopped there. And, yeah, and they just, like you said, they won one, which is disappointing considering that they ushered in that new new template. We, we mentioned it on the, on the local hour. This is... Now the third run sustained with a third different core in the last 12 years in a much more difficult time to do that. There were, what, 12 teams in the league when Boston was making their run and making their name and and lining up all those numbers on those banners? It changed the sport as much as Steph did with his shot. The idea that LeBron chose a different blueprint, and then at the end, he's still going to be there. He's still looking like he's going to be there at the end because he handled the fountain of youth stuff right if Anthony Davis can stay healthy. They're the favorite, correct? It does look a little bit different now with LeBron. He's still great, and I'm sure he's going to have a game where we all point to him and bow down, goat, you're incredible, all-time performance. But if you watch the Lakers now, last night it was the Lonnie Walker game, and Anthony Davis is becoming – now that he's healthy, he's becoming a bigger part of it. It's not like LeBron's not going to probably do what he did in Detroit that one time. LeBron, just closes I think that. in his best version right now, he's a point guard. LeBron, yeah, he's still a Le- phenomenal basketball LeBron player. was 10 of 25 in the last game, and something that had never happened before in the sport in the game before that, where they've got to knock off a champion. Champion on its last legs, they've got to knock it out. LeBron gets to the arena five hours early, and in the first quarter, it's the first playoff game he's ever played of almost 300, doesn't take a single shot. Finishes the game with a stat line no one in the history of playoff basketball has ever had. 20-plus points, 8-plus rebounds, 8 assists, no turnovers, no personal fouls. LeBron is going to be really smart, but Anthony Davis was brought in here for this. Help him age. Help him age with grace. Be somebody who can help him win championships because you're doing all the carrying and we can get 15 points in a fourth quarter from a guy. It doesn't matter who it is, just a guy. Give that me a- whole plan is so fragile. Because he's healthy now, but if he pulls up limp in the next game, it surprises nobody. Which is why we have to ask the question, should the Lakers rest their starters in game good five? Question. <laughs> it's a good question. The weird thing, too, is with Anthony Davis, if you look at his splits, on even number games, he's amazing. And then in odd number games, he's a completely different person. But what is that? I don't know. It's, what, it's the okay, oddest but thing. But he was he's fine just last night. No, but wait, okay. But it's look. random, the actual odds and evens. Yeah, but he's really great. That's he even does, game, but Dan, for someone as great as him, he will just put out a game randomly. It's like, oh, where, where is he? I'm, I'm not disputing that. Uh, Golden State in that series has no answers for him. At the end of that game last night, did you see who was guarding Steph? It was him! Uh, Steph missed the two shots at the end that you need Steph to make to make it 2-2 instead of 3-1. It was a switch, though. LeBron was actually on It was a pick, but... Okay, but I'm saying that Anthony Davis is... uh, uh, The two missed shots had to be taken on the perimeter at the top of the key, guarded by Anthony Davis. He's a problem defensively. Yeah, the fact that he's gotten his body to the point that he's not a liability in that spot, and he's still a, a huge problem for Steph Curry to deal with. When you just think about the injuries that he's faced this year, the... The L.A. Lakers got healthy at the exact right time, and they're probably making the NBA Finals. Where was Steph throwing that ball at the end? Was he just trying to avoid the jump ball, and he was just yes. hoping someone was behind him? Yeah, he was hoping a teammate would come rescue him. He, he just had to get rid of it. Again, I have spent a lot of time over the last few years. I don't reject this style of basketball, even though a lot of old-timers don't like all the three-point shooting. I'm amazed by the athleticism of what it takes to be Anthony Davis and not get Rudy Gobert out of the league because Bam Adebayo's are coming and they're physically gifted and they can guard everybody. And you need Anthony Davis to be a defensive disruptor that makes you even say, oh, three out of four games, Draymond's not even going to be a problem for him. And Draymond's a problem for everybody. Draymond's one of the best we've ever seen. And in one game, I see that's – I don't think it was even odd. I think it's, oh, they had Draymond a whole lot on Anthony Davis in that second game. And – People want Anthony Davis to be better than Draymond Green. Okay, it's hard. It's a difficult thing to do, even if you're as great as Anthony Davis, which is why Mike trades Bam out of bio every couple of games. Ah! Dan, first take right now. Stephen A. Colon, I'm done with Julius Randle. Wow. Whoa. Wow. Late to the party. What an announcement. (laughs) Well, uh, he has been a public Knicks fan. 
in a way that's got to be uncomfortable because he gets really loud and very very theatrical, very soap opera. His allegiance, he's a journalist, but never more so is he an entertainer than throwing away all his credentials like Jeremy Taché in the name of I just am a fanboy. Stephen A. Smith on the Knicks is that more than any other team. Uh, a lot of people are criticizing what they're calling clown analysis from him, including Hollinger, because the analysis in the halftime show is either player A stepped up and was a superstar or failed, and the analysis after that is let's rip player two and player three, and it's not what Tim Legler is doing or, or, or J.J. Redick when they're analyzing the ins and outs of what's happening on the court. Well, they're doing it wrong. Do they not get how the game is played? Stephen A. wears all black. It's the Knicks funeral. He says things, and that's it. He's very upset, as you would be, if Julius Randle was one of the worst postseason players ever because you you need somebody better than Julius Randle. In the playoffs, you need to have a player who's better than that. Yes, they have three players who are – none of them are number one players, the, the Knicks. They have three number two players or number three players, and, and they don't have a Jimmy Butler. Tyler Hero would be one of their best players. He's like our fourth yeah, best that's player. That's correct. But whatever Stephen A. Smith is saying is better analysis than blaming the Miami weather for what the Knicks are going through right now. How many people are doing that? It's Greenberg and who else? Jalen Rose. Jalen Rose. Greeny cited Jalen yeah. Rose, though, as like a scientific yeah. fact. He's like, my friend Jalen Rose has said many times he's played down there, of course. Well, it's an I'm, indoor sport, though. I'm just telling you guys, if you thought this Knicks, thing, wa this Knicks thing was annoying, wait till football season and the Jets starts. Like if you thought this was bad, oh, the when, when the media member, when Greeny puts on, Greeny called the acquisition of Aaron Rodgers the best day of his life. Sad life. Replacing Le'Veon Bell's acquisition. <laughs> oh. Remember, it, remember how excited he was for Le'Veon Bell. Yeah. The best day of his life. But as Mike told you yesterday, the day that his children were born, not a great day. Hell on wheels. Yeah, everyone, everyone <laughs> lies about that. Chris. You have, a t you have a daughter? I do. Was that the best day of your life when she was born? It was stressful. Yeah. So, <laughs> Billy, you have a daughter. Was it that was the a good day. Why yeah. was it not a good day? Was it the best day of your life? It actually, to be honest with you, it was like during, there were still restrictions, so no one could get to the hospital to bother us. So, like, it was, like, very, like, quiet. I think bringing the daughter home is as emotional. Like, I feel like it's so stressful of everything. You just want everything to go well. Yeah, Mike, was, Mike is saying stressful. that's terrible, too. It's you're walking through the door, and you're like, okay, now I'm responsible for this thing that needs me to eat for the rest of its life. Well, no, and I was hoping my dog wouldn't eat it. Like, that's a, you know, that's a whole thing. <laughs> Smother it. The yeah. first time you bring the baby up to the dog to smell is, like, a little awkward. We did the whole thing where you have a blanket, and you introduce the blanket first. Uh, yeah. What would you do, I like, Greg? If Jumpin' Charlie was around and you're blessed with another grandchild, how would you handle that situation? You know what I'd do? I would love the dog. I would love my son. And that kind of thing.